give this energy. Um, we're going to dig in. Amen? Yeah. There's two passages of scripture, both coming from the gospel according to Matthew this morning. Um, if you're in your church Bible that we just handed out to you, um, you can go to page 786 to start off with, but it will also be on the screen. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It reads as follows. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand and gives it and gives and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Next passage of scripture, same book, Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at one of the parables of Jesus, also starting at verse 14. We're finishing up our series this week on stewardship. Matthew 25, page 807, in your church Bible. Verses 14 through 28. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away, and the one who had received five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who with two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy over few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, you did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Can we say thanks be to God? Thanks be to God. Let's spend a few moments talking about let's light up the world. Let's light up the world. Let's drop a word of prayer. God, bring our minds to this particular moment. Pull our thoughts from all of the scattered places that they may be. Hold our ears, God, that we may hear and be attuned to your voice. Speak in spite of us and beyond us. God, that when we hear you, we might be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 There are many reasons for hiding things. Some of them good. Some of them bad, but at the end of the day, it all serves one purpose, to make sure we hide them well enough for them not to be revealed, that they may remain concealed. Before my father's death, he lost several years before my father's death, he lost about 150 pounds. And in the subsequent years, after his loss of weight, he and my mom began to find stashes of food all over the house that dad had hid over the years that he had been struggling with his weight. And my dad's response to this was, yes, I hid all this food, but I could not remember where I hid. <laughs> and I started to think about this, and I said, you know, this idea that if we don't use something, we lose it might be connected to this. Sometimes we become so good at hiding stuff. 
that we forget where we place it, or we forget altogether that we have it in the first place. And what's the result? We lose it. But what's the use in losing something or hiding something more specifically that's worth sharing? Yeah. When we look at the parable that Jesus tells in the book of Matthew chapter 25, we are looking specifically at a master, a man. And more currently, more current language in our particular culture would be not necessarily slave, but servant. Because when we think slave, we think of the connotations of the history of this country. Yeah. But for this particular parable, slave meant more something like servant. I mean, what master gives his slave money, right? To handle, to serve it. And so a man is going on a trip, and talent here represents a weight of money. It's a metric of weight for money. And he entrusts to three of his servants portions of this money. To one, he gives five talents. To a second, he gives two. And to the third, he gives one, each according to their ability. And so the first two take this money, and they make more money off of it. Which leads me to believe that because not one but two of them did it, they had some kind of basic understanding that this is what their master expected, right? Which also leads me to surmise that the third, the third um, servant also had access to the same knowledge, but out of fear, didn't really abide by it. So much so that we can even see that he only got one talent, which means he has a history of not really being able to be responsible over a lot of stuff because they were each given according to their ability. So Master stays a lot, a, away for a long time. So he hides this money, but he has plenty of time to dig it up and make use of it. And he does it. He it right where it is. Master comes back. The first two have doubled their master's sum. They are given more. The third has not done anything with his talent and what little he has is taken away. Now we have been talking about stewardship and I know talent here specifically represents money, which for us is treasure, right? But figuratively speaking, this parable can also extend to mean any resource that we have that we're supposed to be utilizing for the glory of God. So it's our time, it's our talent, it's our treasure, it's our temple. Now in Matthew chapter five, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And he says, let your good works show before humanity, right? That they may see them and give glory to your Father in heaven. And so in Matthew chapter 5, our good stewardship over these things that God has given us is the light that we have to show in this world. And I think it's safe to say that hiding the things that we've been given to bring God glory... <coughs> is not a good use of our stewardship. Amen? Amen? So there are two things that are given in this first parable as to why this man did not use what he was given. Fear and laziness. Fear and laziness. The most common fear that we know of is the fear of failure. And if we really think about it, most of the things that we're afraid of is connected to failure, right? or a loss of some kind. So for example, I am afraid that if I commit to giving a percentage of my money, that that means that I will not have enough to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. And me or my family will what lose out because I will not be able to cover something in my life. So there's this connection many times with fear to this understanding of fear um, and loss, this failure and loss. But then I looked and I said, but the master called him lazy. But this says that he dug a hole because he was scared. How does that connect to laziness? Well, laziness isn't just what we don't want to do. It's also connected to what we are unwilling to do. So consider the, the understanding that our ability to be good stewards over what we have is directly connected to our willingness to risk failure and loss. Our willingness to risk failure and loss. See, being the light of the world is not about not failing. It's about making the right decision to do the right thing even though failing is an option. Right? 
You hear me? Yeah. God does not promise or place a burden on us of victory. That's God's plan. Amen. Right? Have you ever considered that maybe, just maybe, it is how we respond to our failures that will allow someone watching us to say, I want what they got. Yes. In early Christianity, when Christians were being slaughtered, many people saw that as a failure of their God. Yes. But it was their refusal to renounce the name of Jesus. They had other people saying, I don't know what's up with this thing called Christianity, but we need to take a second look. Yeah. Yeah. Right? There's a power to this thing. Sometimes it is how we respond to our failures that determine whether or not people want what we have. You don't have to be victorious. God has promised that if we do what we've been asked to do. So oftentimes we hide what we've been given because of fear or because of laziness. But now let's turn the rest of our time to this idea, this concept of light. What is it about light that makes us the light of the world? What was Jesus really saying? Well, the first thing that is very profound about light is that there is no other part of creation known to be faster than the speed of light. No other part of creation. It is the fastest known thing in creation to date. All right? Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. That equals out to about 671 million miles per hour. Mm -hmm. Now we ask, why has the world not changed? And maybe we should be asking, is everybody who loves the Lord using their light? <laughs> right? There is a swiftness to this. There was a philosopher in ancient China by the name of uh, Mokuzu. He was known as the master of light. Okay? And believe it or not, his, he had devoted his life to pretty much the eradication of darkness through the spreading of light. And he did this because he was known as a military genius who dedicated his time to nonviolent actions. So he would travel from place to place trying to convince leaders that they did not need to engage in war. He was committed to universal love, to the equality of people. He was committed to ending poverty. And he devised a way of um, critiquing doctrines and laws to determine whether or not they actually benefited the good of most people. Well, with the rise of the Qian government and the establishment of what we know, now know as China, there came legalism. And all of these forms of free thought began to be um, washed out. And they began to burn the works of this philosopher. Many of his pupils actually were killed trying to salvage the message given. And yet today, we still have enough information about what he did and what he believed for it to be marked in history, right? Fifth century, it's a long time ago. Light has a way of moving so fast and going to where it wants to go that if it doesn't want to be caught, it ain't going to be caught. There are stars in our atmosphere that we can see now that in actuality, the light of the stars that we see now. In actuality, those stars are actually dead in real time. Because they are so far away, it takes so long for them to reach the, the view of our atmosphere that they have died sometimes hundreds, thousands, millions of years before we see that light. Yeah. What does this say to us? It says to us that our light outlives us. our lives now. Yeah. That light will live beyond yeah. the moment in time. Yeah. Second thing we find out about light is so profound is that light is the way in which we perceive the world and we communicate with it. Mm. It is the primary tool for <clears throat> perceiving the world and communicating in it. So if we have people who are in darkness around us, yeah. That means that their perception of the world is very skewed. They have an inability to see the truth and the power of what really is. And if they cannot see that, then how they communicate in this world is also going to be skewed. Right? Now, darkness is only defined in conjunction with light. Darkness is defined as the absence of light. But let us not do 
darkness any injustice because darkness has a way of creeping up real quick, right? A couple of weeks ago, my daughter and our Kaya were at the grocery store and we were in the parking lot. We began to cross the road where our car was when a car turned onto the road where we were. So we were already crossing when this woman turns in. I look up, she looks me dead in my face, and I promise you she accelerates. We have to jump back in order to miss her from, get, keep her from hitting us. And my daughter says, mommy, what happened? Why did she stop? I was too mad, too, I mean, I was in a dark, <laughs> This 
is a city on a hill. The church is a city on a hill. Those streets are a city on a hill. Our homes, our jobs. The question is, are we building cities on hills where people can see the light and know that there is life where those cities are? Because if we can build these cities, then that means that we have been given the power and the opportunity to shape how people perceive this world yeah. and therefore how they communicate with one another in it. Yeah. That is the power that God has given us yeah. in this life. Yeah. The third thing that is so profound about light that we find is that light in and of itself pretty much stands as a self-existent thing. It's self-explanatory. So both light and sound travel in what we call waves. But the difference is sound waves have to have some other form of matter in order to bounce off of in order for sound to be made or to fulfill its purpose. Light stands solo, right? So light can travel for millions of miles in nothingness, right? But if there was somebody there to see it, they would see it. All right? So it kind of moves solo. This understanding that we are designed not necessarily to shine alone, but that we don't need others to reverberate our light in order for our light to shine. Right? Only to multiply. Okay? So there is this understanding that light stands on its own. It's self explanatory. Now, I love Aesop. I don't know how many of you know Aesop, but he has. This um, great little short fable called The Travel, um, The Boastful Traveler, and it's about this man who has traveled to all these far and distant lands, and he comes back home and he begins to stand in the streets and tell everybody about just how many heroic deeds he did while he was in this far and distant land. And he says, Well, when I was in Rhodes, he says, I left so far that nobody could ever leave as far as I left. And he just went on and on and on and on. He says, and there are witnesses in Rhodes that can attest to how far I left. A bystander is standing on the side of the road. And he says, well, good sir. He says, no need for witnesses. He says, if you did what you said in Rhodes, just pretend like this is Rhodes. And leave for us. Right? More like the story. If you do something well, you have no need to boast. No need for justification. No need for convincing people that your life is real. Just let your life be what it is and stand on it. You don't have to do all this extra stuff. God says just exist it. Let it be. And when I looked up the definition that is most often used for light in the New Testament, this is what I found. It is most often defined as the manifestation of God's self-existent life. Yes. Divine illumination to reveal and impart life through Christ. Amen. Amen. So the light that we are shining, it ain't our light, y'all. Yeah. It's God's light. It is the self-existent yeah. light of God that shines through us. Yeah. This takes us to our final point about life, or light. And that is that there are portions of light or kinds of light that are actually not able to be seen by the naked eye. Mm -hmm. So when we consider the fact that we often hide our light, Lights are not intended to be hidden. In fact, they are intended to do the opposite. They are intended to often reveal things that are hidden. So if you look at certain gamma rays or x-rays or infrared lights, they cannot be seen by our natural eye. But through a special lens and technology that we have, we can look out into space, for example, and we can see gamma rays, the explosions that are happening in gamma ray, right? Now, why is this so important for us? Why is this so powerful for us? This is so powerful because that means that there are certain things that are tangibly real in our world and our universe.
words that we cannot see with our natural eye, but are real nonetheless. Yeah. And that means for us that our life, our works, our stewardship, they don't save us. Grace saves us. But what our works do, do do is that they say that the God that created this universe, the God of love, the God of power, the God of truth, that is often untangibly seen by the naked eye is just as real as all these things in this yeah. world that we can't see, right? Because we don't have this capacity to see them. This is why I believe that scientists like Albert Einstein believe in God. Because to study creation is to inextricably point to a creator. Right. So just consider for a moment the power that your everyday, ordinary, mundane activity point to a self-existent life known as God. A God who is victorious. And a God who has promised us that if we honor the call to be the light, then that people will see that who are in darkness. And they will give glory to the God of that light. And they will have the opportunity to no longer live in the dark. So my question is, can we light up the world? Yes. Can we light up the world? So I don't know where you are in your life right now. And I know there are many reasons why we hide, why we hesitate to make the right decisions, to do the right things, to make the commitments we should be making. For some of us it's insecurity, for some of us it's pain, for some of us we're overwhelmed with our life. But wherever you find yourself today, what I am suggesting to you is that God has directly promised to us that there was a power within us yeah. that we had to shift and shape this world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that it's not something that we have done on our own. It's something that is already in us that God has given us. Yes. We don't have to worry about being victorious. God has promised us. We don't even have to worry about failing because even how we respond to our failures means that God can redeem them and bring someone closer to the yeah. Bible. Yes. yes. The problem is we don't believe it. We can't move past the here and now enough to grasp it. We can't move out of the clutches of our fear enough to live it and to be it. So I don't know what your story is. You know what your story is. You know your struggles. You know the things that you need God to work out this morning. So whatever those things are, I want you to just take a moment exactly where you are. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to spend time with the real and tangible God that is right here with you right now. Even your prayers in this moment speak to the existence and the proof of that God. Whatever it is you need God to do for you in this place, connect with God right now. You are in the presence of a lot of people who are believing with you that this is real, that this is true. This is a very powerful place to be in to pray. So just be honest with God in this place. God, I'm scared. God, I'm unwilling to lose stuff. God, I'm, I'm insecure. God, I feel like I gotta prove myself all the time. God, I compare myself to other people. God, I got too much on my plate. God, I'm overwhelmed emotionally. God, my body hurts. God, I'm struggling financially. God, I've lost my job. God, my kids are in the street. Whatever it is that has clinched your mind in this moment and, and pretty much put out your light, just lift it up to God. Lift it up to God. You're right where you are in your place of humility, bow your head, grab the hand of the person next to you.
same power that runs through you runs through them as a part of creation. So you don't stand alone in overcoming this. They don't have to know what it is. You don't have to know what theirs is. All you have to know is that everybody has it. And we need God to come and lift it. So that our light can break free and dispel the darkness all around us. So this is not a selfish prayer. It may seem selfish, but it's not. You're praying these things because you want to be able to light someone else's path. But you can't do it unless you're free enough to do it. Hallelujah. And so whatever is binding you right now, yes. God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That because you are the looser of our bonds, you are the one who makes us free. You are the source of our salvation, Almighty God. You are our redeemer, and you are our provider, and you are our deliverer, Almighty God. Because you are all those things to us, and because of the promises you have made to us, God, we pray now in Jesus' name that, that these shackles will be broken in this place today, Almighty God. Shackles of fear and insecurity, God. Shackles, Almighty God, of laziness than anything known to us, Almighty God. Lord, we want to be your vessels. Yeah. And God, we know that by shining the light you have given to us, it grants us the hope that even what is undone in our life will be done. Yeah. God, it gives us the hope, Almighty God, that the promises you have given are already making their way into reality, yeah. Almighty God. Lord, it gives us the hope, Almighty God, that we will be victorious, not because we bring forth victory, God, but because you bring forth victory, God. Lord, we pray for our children today, God. We pray for those who are grieving and mourning today, Almighty God. We pray for those who are in the clutches of evil today, Almighty God. We pray for those who are blind, Almighty God, blind to the ideals of, of racism, God, and blind to the ideals of abuse and addiction, Almighty God. Whatever the blindnesses are that are in our community, God, and in our world, God, we pray for those people, God,
And when we walk out of these doors today, God, may it not leave us, but allow this to cling to us.